So we've seen the magic of open sets and interior points. And now we've had an introduction to accumulation points, coming from a motivation that we wanted to be able to speak about the boundary of a set in kind of a more nuanced fashion. Because what we're setting up here is a way to define what it's going to mean for a set to be closed. And the way that we're seeing this is that we're situating sets along a spectrum where most sets are kind of in the middle, where they might include some of their boundary points, but they might not include all of them. Sets that include all of their boundary points are going to be at this end of the spectrum. We're going to call those the closed sets. And the prototypical example is to take any old set and find its closure, take its union with all its accumulation points. That's the sort of canonical way to get a closed set. On the other end of the spectrum are the open sets, which include none of their boundary points. And the canonical way to create an open set is to take any old set and just find its interior, just delete all of its boundary points from it if they were there in the first place. And what we get is the interior, which is an open set. So sets reside along the spectrum from open, sets that include none of their boundary points, to close sets that include all of their boundary points. But there's a lot of room in between, and over the course of the next couple of videos, we're going to explore that in-between space just a little bit. But to get us started, in this video we're going to define closed set and look at some examples of how closedness behaves. So the intuition behind a closed set is that any point which can touch the set belongs to the set. Anything which is on the boundary of my set is actually a member of my set. So we define a closed set in terms of this naive notion that we should try to include all of its boundary points. But then we recognize that including all of our boundary points is going to automatically include any of the isolated points from A. Remember, isolated points are always boundary points. And so really the points that are more important to include into a closed set are those points that otherwise would not be included but which are boundary points. So this particular A was not closed because it doesn't include these two points which show up in the boundary. But because the isolated boundary points are already going to be included in my set because isolated points had to belong to A in the first place, so these isolated points are already going to be part of the boundary which belonged to A in the first place, but then there's also accumulation points that if the accumulation point boundary point belonged to my set originally, then of course it's going to belong to a closed set that contains it. So we don't need to worry about adding these uh, accumulation points that already belong to the set. What we need are to be able to throw in the boundary points which didn't originate in the set itself. And those boundary points must also have been accumulation points of A. So in other words, if my goal is to include all of my boundary points into a closed set, then it suffices just to include all of A's accumulation points. If you throw all of the accumulation points of A together with A itself, then because A already includes its non-accumulation boundary points that are isolated, throwing in the accumulation points is going to throw in the rest of the boundary points of A. And so if I take the union of A with its boundary, I get the same thing as the union of A with its derived set. In other words, including its boundary is the same as including all of its accumulation points. Now the definition of accumulation point is a little bit nicer to work with than the definition of boundary. With boundary we had to check two things, right? We had to check that the point was not interior to A, but we also had to check that it wasn't interior to A complement, so there's kind of a lot to do. Whereas the definition of accumulation point is kind of a simpler single thing that we can check. So we'll call a set closed if every one of its accumulation points is already an element of A. So this is going to be the notion that we use, right? That if the derived set of A is a subset of A, if every accumulation point of A is an element of A, we're going to call that a closed set. And if that's the case, then if I take the union of A with its derived set, it's going to give me the same thing as A itself. In other words, the derived set is not going to give me any new elements, and the accumulation points are not going to be any new elements of A. But the union of A with its derived set is otherwise known as the closure. So this is another way to think about what it means for a set to be closed. If I'm equal to my closure, that means I'm a closed set, and vice versa. So let's look at some examples. How about the closed intervals from A to B? Why should we expect that the closed intervals are indeed closed sets? Well, in order to verify this definition, we have to figure out what are the accumulation points of a closed interval. And then, are we sure that those points belong to the set itself? So, to prove this, let's let x be an accumulation point of 
the closed interval from A to B. Our burden of proof is that we need to show that X must have belonged to AB itself, right? So if I'm an accumulation point, then I belong to the set. That's our burden of proof to show that a set is closed. So let's try to prove this by contraposition. Let's suppose that X doesn't belong to the closed interval from A to B. Well, if that's true, then one of two things has to be the case. Either X is less than A strictly, or X is greater than B strictly. So we're going to consider those two cases separately, although we're really only going to look at one of them in depth because you can fill in the details on the other one. It's completely analogous. So let's take this first case. If x is strictly less than a, so I'll put x over here. Right? If x is strictly less than a, then because the real numbers are the way that they are, because of the order principles and the density principles, that means that if I'm strictly less than a, I'm going to have some room to stretch out without touching a. Right? That's the idea behind what we're about to do. So let's try to reason by contradiction. Let's suppose that x is not uh, uh, an accumulation point. right? X is not an accumulation point if we can stretch out our arms some epsilon distance such that the only thing that I can touch within my epsilon's reach is myself. The only element of A that I can touch uh, potentially is myself within a distance of epsilon. Well, if I'm standing at X and X is strictly less than A, that means that I can indeed stretch my arms some epsilon distance without touching A. And if I don't touch A from down here, I'm not going to touch any other element in the interval from A to B either. So how long should my arms be? Can I make my arms short enough that I'm not touching the set? Well, sure. If I just take the midpoint, for example, between x and a, half of x plus a, right? That is strictly greater than x, and so it has a positive epsilon distance away from x, but it's also strictly less than a, and therefore is definitely outside of the interval from a to b. And so this length epsilon, half the distance from x to a, or 1 half of a minus x, that reaches only halfway to a. So if I let that be my epsilon, then I will have shown that there exists an epsilon greater than zero, such that no element of the set A is within an epsilon's reach of x. And we do that just by showing that the right-hand endpoint x plus epsilon, that's half of x plus a, is strictly less than half of a plus a, because we assumed that x was less than a. And so it's strictly less than a. So since this right-hand endpoint is strictly less than a, that means that this entire epsilon neighborhood over here, x minus epsilon to x plus epsilon, is disjoint from the closed interval from A to B. And that means that x could not have been an accumulation point. Right? So there is a contraposition argument. If x is not an element of the closed interval from A to B, then it cannot be an accumulation point of AB. The same argument holds if x is strictly greater than B. We just have to say we're reaching our, our arms out to my right, your left, towards the set instead. Completely analogous argument. So every accumulation point of this set is a member of the set. And therefore, closed intervals are indeed closed sets. Again, just like with our open intervals uh, proof, we only show this for finite examples, but you can fill in the details for what happens if this is an infinite closed interval. So what other kinds of sets might qualify as closed sets? Well, one of the examples that I often comes to my mind of sets that could be closed are discrete sets. Remember, these are sets all of whose points are isolated. So they seem to be really good candidates, right? Because isolated points can't be interior points. Isolated points are always boundary points of a given set. So is it true that discrete sets are closed? Let's check. So my intuition right, is if I'm made up of a bunch of isolated points, then that means I should be able to reach out my arms and not touch another element of the set. Therefore, all of the points of A should be boundary points. Again, because if I reach out some epsilon distance, I'm going to get points of A, in other words, myself, but I'm also going to get points outside of A right, because I'm isolated from the rest of A. And so for uh, a discrete set, every single point of A is going to be a boundary point of A. But take a look at the definition of closed set one more time. The definition of closed set requires not only that every point of A be, well, it actually doesn't require that every point of A be a boundary point of A. It requires the opposite, right? It requires the inclusion to go the other way. It requires every boundary point of A to belong to A. So if we try to investigate that a little bit more closely for a discrete set, the question becomes, can a discrete set have a boundary point that it doesn't already include? So here we are back with this example again. This is a set of all negative whole number powers of two. So one, one half, one fourth, one eighth, and so forth. So this set is a discrete set. We saw this set a couple of videos ago. Um, 
but there is a point on the real line, there is a number, 0, which is an accumulation point of this set. Now why is 0 an accumulation point of the set? Because no matter what, if I'm standing at 0 and I reach my arms out on both sides of me, I'm going to be able to touch at least one element of this sequence. There is at least one negative integer power of 2 within any epsilon radius of 0, because Another way to think about this set is it's the set of terms of the sequence 2 to the minus n, which converges to 0. So within any epsilon neighborhood of 0, there is a negative integer power of 2. So 0 is an accumulation point of this set. But 0 is not an element of this set. Therefore, this set did not contain all of its accumulation points. And since this set didn't contain all of its accumulation points, that means that this set, even though it's a discrete set, it wasn't a closed set. So a lot of discrete sets are probably closed, but any discrete set that has this sort of accumulating behavior, right, where there are real numbers that that set sort of really closely approximates, one of the themes of this course, remember, is being able to approximate things by other things, right? If my discrete, if the points in my discrete set can kind of build up and approximate some element that's not already in my set, then I'm not going to be a closed set. So just because we're discrete doesn't mean that we're closed. So this is one of the things that we're going to see happens a lot in analysis, is that we have uh, you know, the ability to sort of say that something is true, like discreteness is something that's true for every single point in my set, but it's kind of true in a different way for each different point. So each of my points in my discrete set has kind of a slightly shorter radius that it can reach out. And if we try to extend that logic to every single point in this infinite set, my arms are getting shorter and shorter and shorter in my discrete set, and they get so short that there is no shortest epsilon that we could choose to show that, um, to show that if I include zero in this set that I would end up with uh, a set that's still discrete, right? And so because every one of my points has a increasingly shorter epsilon, there is no positive epsilon that's kind of my smallest possible uh, radius that I can reach out here. And so it's that accumulating behavior that makes this discrete set not closed. It has an accumulation point that is outside of it. So the next place that we want to go is to try and sew these definitions together. Like, does closedness defined in terms of accumulation points have any obvious relationship to openness, which is defined in terms of interior points? Remember, Interior points and accumulation points have a complicated relationship. Every interior point of a set is an accumulation point. But most accumulation points of a set, most, most interesting ones, are not actually interior points. So is there some nice way to make that relationship uh, clarified? That's what we're going to look at in the next video. The relationship between open sets and closed sets that is probably my favorite way of understanding what closed sets really are without really having to bother with accumulation.